Pastor Laura AAEC and good morning. I hope you all are having a blessed, blessed week. I am going to start by reading a scripture, a very familiar scripture, um, Philippians, starting um, the fourth chapter, starting at the fourth verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say this again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation, I'm going to say that again, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, with guard your hearts, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord for the reading of his word and amen to it all. Um, I just want to give you guys a word of encouragement. Continue to trust God. Continue to trust God no matter what is going on. The word tells us not to be anxious for anything for anything but in every situation every situation and I repeat that because sometimes I forget it but in every situation by prayer and petition so we're allowed to give it all to God we're allowed to lay everything down at his feet and then he'll give us the peace that transcends all understanding And that's what I believe a lot of us, if not all of us, want is just peace. The word tells us exactly how we need to do it. So do not forget to get on your knees. Do not forget to pray. Do not forget to give it to God because he is our father. He wants to carry our burdens. So AAEC, I just wanted to give you that word of encouragement today. Continue to trust God. Give it to God. And I pray that you all continue to have a wonderful week. All right? Stay blessed. Bye-bye.
I'm reading from Psalm 36 using the New King James Version. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes, and when he finds out his iniquity, and when he hates. The word of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He devises wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. Verse 5. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the cloud. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Verse 10. Oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the fruit of the pride Come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. There are the dead workers of iniquity have fallen, and they've been cast down, and are not able to rise. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Psalm 36 is a Psalm of David. And the Psalm of David here is a little different. This one starts with a, a description of the wicked people. And then what it does is it talks about the steadfast love of the Lord. God's love, the loving kindness, his mercy, all of those words mean the same thing here. So when we talk about the steadfast love of the Lord, before David works through that, he talks about the enemy. The world is filled with people who reject God, reject his truth, and verse 1 to 4 walks through that. They have no fear of God, their mouths are speaking evil things and full of deceit, and their actions are full of seeking out trouble and problems for people. And so David says, God, how do we deal with that situation? Well, we deal with it because we can trust the steadfast love of the Lord. We can trust his, his love for us. And so three times in this passage, it talks about the steadfast love of the Lord. First of all, it says that the steadfast love of the Lord is righteous and really knows no limits. In verse six, it talks about your righteousness is like great mountains and your judgments are like a, the great deep. So God's steadfast love is it knows no bounds there's nothing higher nothing too deep his love is amazing the second one is found in verse 8 where it says trust his love because he pours out blessing upon his children they are abundantly satisfied with the fullness you give them drink from the rivers of their pleasure and you go god you just meet their every need your steadfast love pours out blessings upon us. And then finally in verse 11, it tells us to trust the steadfast love of the Lord, to protect us from that which is evil. So it says in verse 11, let not the foot of pride come against me, nor let the hand of the wicked drive me away. And so God is, or David is saying here, God, your steadfast love will protect me from the evil one. Okay, for us today, what is this psalm saying? Well, first of all, it's saying in a world filled with wickedness, 
who have no fear of God, we can trust his steadfast love. Secondly, it's saying God's steadfast love is there to protect us, there to bless us, and there to release righteousness into our lives and our world. And finally, he says the steadfast love is so that our eyes do not lose their focus on God. Don't lose your trust in God by looking at the world around you. His steadfast love will take care of us. He will protect us. God's steadfast love, his, his mercy, his grace, it's there to protect us and take care of us. Let's pray. Dear Father, your steadfast love is absolutely what we rely on when we're dealing with a world that is full of hatred for you, seeking to deceive and to plot evil. And yet, Lord, your steadfast love knows no limits, knows no area where it cannot function and work for our blessing and work for our protection. So, Father, fill our world with your love. Fill our hearts with that love. And you will protect us in the midst of all the uncertainty of life that we face. And just like David gave a threefold description of your steadfast love, we recognize that your steadfast love will protect us and take care of us in every situation we face. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Again, I just want to thank our worship team for what they have done and preparing our hearts for this service. I trust that you've had an opportunity to go through the songs that have already been chosen. They've been chosen for this day. I encourage you to do that. Also, for the psalm reading, as we've gone through the psalm, I ask that you stop and think about it and let that word really touch your heart. As we come now to our prayer time, as we look at this month of prayer, as we look at what God has been teaching us in this month, there's been some special moments. And God has spoken into our lives, and I encourage you at this time to take that next step. What do we do after we pray? Well, this is what God instructed the children of Israel. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, it says, It is the Lord who goes before you, he will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. In other words, it's time to move forward. And God is saying, don't be afraid. It, the Lord has already gone ahead of us. So as we look at this here today, one of the things that really touches my heart is also what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to faithfully release what he has promised. God said, I want you to faithfully release what God has promised. And he's asking us to be bold in doing that. It is the Lord who goes before us. He will be with us. So don't look back. Don't look around. And don't look at the circumstances. Always remember, God is going ahead and our eyes are focused on him. One other verse, in Moses speaking in Exodus 14, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm and you'll see the deliverance of the Lord. Moses says, stand. God's gonna, set, God's gonna take care of the Egyptian army there at the Red Sea. But then this is what the Lord says to Moses. Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites, move forward, move on. Let's pray. Father, as we come here today, it's a special day. We've gone through this month of prayer. There's a couple of days left, and we ask that you speak into us in these last few days. Lord, there's some powerful things that you have for us as individuals and as a church. Father, we don't want to miss anything that you have for us. So speak, I pray, as we, your children, wait on you these last two days. But Father, you are already speaking what you want to see happen after. You want us to move forward. Don't be afraid. 
Don't let the circumstances around us determine whether we move forward. Help us not to be afraid. Help us not to look around. Help us not to look back. Help us to only have our eyes focused on Jesus. And as we look at Jesus, he is going to lead us forward and we're going to see the victory that you have laid out for us. Father, I release your people to be a blessing in their homes, in their workplaces. Lord, wherever they are, they will be shining lights, shining the light of Jesus. Father, that they would be that city on a hill that people look to and say, there's something different. Father, release your people to be that kind of child that moves forward when you tell us to move forward and not, not be in fear. Father, we pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before I go to the offering time, reminded of Joshua when they went into Jericho. He picked up the shofar and they blew the shofar after they had walked around the city. And then the people of God moved forward and took the city. And in a sense, that's what I'm asking you to do. Friday morning, I will blow this in the service. I encourage you to recognize that God is saying to his people, it's time to move forward. Don't worry about the fact that the Red Sea's there. He's going to take care of that. Don't worry about the enemy behind you. He'll take care of that. I encourage you to be a people who prepare our hearts to move forward. All right. It's time for our offering. And as an offering time, I'm going to also read another passage. This is found in Luke chapter 12. And guess how it starts? Don't be afraid. <laughs> Fear not, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give them to the poor and the needy, provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's pray. Father, it's time for we, your people, to give. And your challenge to us in this time, in this challenging time, don't be afraid. It is our Father's desire. It's our Father's wish to give us the kingdom, to make the kingdom available, to let the kingdom of God be our focus, to invest our treasure into the kingdom where no moth can destroy it, no rust can deal with it, because where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. And you just say, don't be afraid. So Father, for your people as they give, may they give with a, a heart that says, my treasure is going in heaven. My treasure will be where you will take care of it for eternity. Lord, we want our heart to be on the kingdom. We want our hearts to not be focused on what we have in this world. We want our hearts to be focused on your kingdom. So as we give, Lord, receive this. Meet every need. Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done through the giving of your people. Take it, multiply it. May it meet every need. Because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A reading from the book of First Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, from the New International Version. The Day of the Lord. 
Now brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Amen. Here ends the word. May we all be blessed with the world. Good morning, everyone. As always, it's a privilege to be with you this morning, although obviously I would have loved for us to be gathering face to face. Uh, until then, we continue to be thankful for the technology that allows us to do this. Now, we are currently on a series on the book of 1 Thessalonians. You have heard messages on stronger faith, a consistent walk, and just last week, Pastor Dave spoke on the last six verses of 1 Thessalonians 4, where he focused on the need to have a clear understanding of the coming resurrection. Now, the coming resurrection is based on the foundation that Jesus first rose from the dead. And when Jesus comes back, those who have died will rise first. And then the rest of us who are still alive will join them to be with Jesus forever. That's what it says at the end of 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, just reflect a moment with me on what Paul is saying. Sometimes we can get so comfortable with these concepts and think, Oh yeah, I've heard about this. Sure, let's go get some shawarma now. I'm kind of hungry. Now, Paul just told them, Don't be too sad about dying because God's people have a hope. What is that hope? Please close your eyes and try to imagine this. This is the hope we all have in the face of death. Jesus died. He rose from the dead. He's going to come back from heaven and with a loud command, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, meaning we're not going to miss this. And then those who died, who believe in Christ, they will rise from the dead. And then all of us who are still alive, who believe in Christ, we will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. Can you picture that in your mind? This isn't a normal day-to-day -day stuff, friends. 
This will be the next biggest event in all of human history. It will totally eclipse any big news that we have today. Coronavirus, a possible vaccine, the signing of the peace treaties, any of the world wars or any of the other wars that we have ever seen. Now, if you're hearing this for the first time, if you're one of the Thessalonians hearing Paul's words about this ultimate resurrection, if you're hearing about the biggest event in all of human history that will happen with 100% certainty, what do you think is one of the first questions that will come to mind? Uh, excuse me, Brother Paul, when is this going to happen? When is it going to go down? Because I kind of want to make sure that I'll be around for it, that I'm ready. And so Paul, anticipating knowing that what he said is pretty mind-blowing and anticipating the most obvious question that will come next. This is what Paul says. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And so here's Jesus' first principle of the second coming. Like a thief in the night, the day of the Lord will be unpredictable. Meaning, do not try to figure out an exact date when Jesus is coming back because we can't. However, just because the day of the Lord is unpredictable does not mean that we should be unprepared. And Paul goes on to describe two kinds of people, those who are prepared and those who are unprepared for the coming of the thief. And he says this, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a, la on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the light or to the darkness, to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober for those who sleep sleep at night and those who get drunk get drunk at night but since we belong to the day let us be sober putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet <clears throat> so according to paul the unprepared are bound for destruction they are children of the night and darkness and they are asleep and drunk meaning they do not have their wits about them and their senses are dull they're slow the prepared, on the other hand, they are children of the light and day. They are awake. They are sober. We put on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Now, this isn't the only place that Paul uses the imagery of armor. Because in Romans 13, 12, he tells them, put on the armor of light. And then in the most popular passage on the armor of God in Ephesians 6, he tells his readers to put on the full armor of God with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness in place, feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, taking up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. The life we are called to live as God's children is not easy. It's a battle. And that's why the image of armor how do we keep finding ways during COVID-19 to stay faithful, worshiping God, praying, reading His Word, encouraging one another, helping the poor, telling people about Jesus? How do we do that? It's hard. What is our motivation to keep going, to keep fighting in the faith? And so here it is. Paul says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. That's our motivation for being people who are prepared. Even if we don't know when Jesus is coming back, we have received salvation through Jesus who died for us so that regardless if we are dead or alive, when He returns, we will live forever with Him. That's our motivation. Now, practically, what does it mean to prepare for Jesus' return? 
if you read 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, you'll notice something. The second part of chapter 4 and the first part of chapter 5, which is our passage this morning, they talk about Jesus' coming return. But this is sandwiched in between the first part of chapter 4 and the second part of chapter 5, which tells them how to live. Meaning the way to prepare for Jesus' second coming is to do what Paul wrote before and after he talked about Jesus' second coming. Now, I'm not going to go into detail because the sermon on the first part of chapter 4 has already been preached. And the sermon on the second part of chapter 5 is next week. But I can summarize some thoughts, and here they are. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to 12, Paul says to live in order to please God, to avoid sexual immorality, to love one another, to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, work with your hands, to win the respect of outsiders, and not be dependent on anybody. Now, this isn't talking about what if I'm out of a job because I'm sick, or because of COVID, or because it's really hard. It's not talking about that. It's talking about people who were sitting home and idle. They didn't want to do anything. They were lazy. And Paul says, no, you need to get to work, to be busy, to mind your own business. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 19, he says this, live in peace with one another, warn the idle. There you go, warn the idle. Don't sit around doing nothing. Encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. And then he says, rejoice always, pray continuously, give thanks in all circumstances. Even in COVID, even when we don't have jobs, even when things are just a mess around the world. Give thanks in all circumstances as we prepare for Jesus to come back. Now, I would like to spend some time talking about that first verse of our passage this morning. In 1 Thessalonians 5, the first set two verses, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of our Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, this isn't the only place that the return of Jesus is referred to as coming like a thief in the night. Here's the other places that we read about it. In Matthew 24 and Luke 12, the parallel passages, he says this, But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not let his house be broken into. And in 2 Peter, it says this, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Peter was Jesus' disciple. So he heard it when Jesus said it the first time. And in Revelation 3 and 16, is Jesus talking. In 3, he says, But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. And in Revelation 16, he says, Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed. Out of all the references of Jesus coming like a thief, Only two are by people other than Jesus. The passage we are looking at today in 1 Thessalonians 5, that was written by Paul. And then the other in 2 Peter, written by Peter. The rest of these scriptures were spoken by Jesus himself. Matthew and Luke are parallel passages, and the other two, they are in Revelation. So the first time we hear Jesus talking about his return like a thief in the night is in Matthew 24. You see, the chapter starts with Jesus leaving the temple and his disciples coming to him and say, Jesus, do you see all these awesome, magnificent buildings? Aren't they great? And then Jesus said to them, Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Now, if Jesus is going to make a statement like this to his disciples, And they've never heard this before. And it's a pretty crazy statement. This is the first question they're going to ask, right? What what do you think they're going to ask? They've never heard something like this before. So if he says, all of these stones, not one will be be left here. Every, Every stone be thrown down. Guess what is the first question they're going to ask is, just like Paul before, they're going to say this. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Uh... Tell us, they said, when will this happen? We want to know. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Come on, Jesus, give us a little bit of the inside scoop. We're your disciples. We're kind of like your your, your best friends. We only, actually, some of us are only your friends you got, right? Come on, just tell us a bit. Does Jesus answer your question? 
And we should all know by now, Jesus rarely answers people's questions directly. He doesn't give them the timing of his return, but he does say, we can look out for the following signs. And so he says, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah. And they will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Imagine, don't be alarmed by wars. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Sound familiar? And then Jesus says, all these are the beginning. They're not the end. They're just the beginning of birth pains. And then Jesus goes on to provide other signs of his impending return. He says, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and they will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets, they will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And then he says this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And so these are some of the signs that Jesus said will precede his return. False messiahs and prophets, wars, famines, earthquakes, the persecution of God's people, people turning away from the faith, an increase in wickedness. And then he said, the gospel will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Nations here meaning not countries. You've heard me preach about this before. Not, not referring to countries, but referring to people groups of the world. Now, we do not have a lot of say, or a lot of control about most of the signs that Jesus is talking about. False prophets, wars, famines, earthquakes, persecution of God's people. We don't have control over that. We don't have much say in that. But we definitely get to take part in that last thing that Jesus talked about. We get to take part in the gospel being preached to all nations, meaning all people, groups of the world. And there are many of them in this country. I've talked about that as well. So do your part in telling people around you about Jesus. Be Jesus with skin onto those who are struggling immensely during this time, this unique time around the world. And then Jesus gets to the part about the timing of his return. But about the day or the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the sun, but only the Father. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch, and he would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at a time and an hour that you do not expect him. Now, you can read about Jesus coming like a thief and him telling us to be ready. And some of us, we can, we can be fearful and we say, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be ready. I'm scared. The thing is, I don't think Jesus, Jesus doesn't strike me as someone who wants his children to do something out of fear. That's not how Jesus is, I don't think. See, religious people do religious activities out of fear and compulsion, but Jesus isn't like that. I think Jesus wants his children to be ready out of joyous anticipation and excitement. Just waiting in joy and anticipation. But some of you are probably thinking, how can I wait in joyous anticipation for Jesus' coming? What does that mean? If you look at this passage, guess what? Jesus says, no one on earth, not even the angels or the Holy Spirit, not even Jesus, knows when he's coming back again. He doesn't know when he's come, coming back again. What does he say? Only who? Only the Father. That's what Jesus says. Now imagine this. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're all hanging out for eternity, right? 
They're having a great love fest. They know each other well. They're hanging out. They're creating galaxies. They're creating stars, species of, of animals and plants on the earth, under the water, in rivers, you know, everywhere, all over. And they're just having a great time in each other's company. There's no jealousy. There's no hatred. It's just pure, unadulterated, pure, holy love between the Father, Son, and Spirit. And in between all this creative energy and all this love, Jesus is working on the rooms in his father's house that he said he was preparing for us. Do you remember that? In John 14 says, I am going to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also, you also may be where I am. That's what he said. So Jesus is doing that right now. He's preparing. He doesn't know when he's coming back. And then out of nowhere, the father is going to turn to the son one day. And he's going to say, and this is why we can be excited with joyous anticipation, right? This is what God the father is going to say to the son. Guess what, son? It's time. Those rooms you've been preparing in my house for our sons and daughters, they're ready. Go get our people. And bring them home. And so let me pray and give the benediction over you this morning. <sighs> Jesus, we can wait in joyful expectation and not fear. Because we are your sons and daughters. We are not slaves. By your spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. You do not make us slaves again to fear. You made us your children. And as your sons and daughters, you have called us to display your love, your generosity, your peace to those who do not know you as the gracious King. And so pour out your spirit upon us, your people. In the uncertainty of COVID-19, the loss of lives and livelihoods, increasing sickness and death, our line evangelical church, hear the words of Jesus and his prayer over you. And Jesus says this to my children and Alain Evangelical Church. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I promise you I will come back. And I will take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. So take heart, be full of joy. You know the way to the place where I'm going. You know me. And then Jesus says, and hear this online evangelical church. He's prayed for you 2,000 years ago already. And this is for you. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And my children and all in evangelical church know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them. And, may, and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as you go out into the world to love and serve the Lord and his people.